All right, ladies and gentlemen, I suggest that we start this uh, panel, which will be dealing with the questions of systemic change, economic reforms, and democracy. What have we learned? What lessons for the future? My name is Danilo Turk. I am former president of Slovenia, and I was asked to chair this panel, to moderate, uh, which obviously is a great privilege and pleasure. We have a great panel now, uh, and I would like to briefly mention the main uh, characteristics of the panelists uh, without going into detail of their CVs, which are very rich and can be, can be discussed in great detail. Jan Schweiner is the economist, director of the Center of Global Economic Governance at Columbia University, teaching also in the Czech Republic and globally, a great economic expert and thinker. Grigory Avlinsky is a professor of State University of Higher School of Economics in Moscow, and also globally known as the founder of the Abloko party and the leader of that party in Russia. Ivan Miklos, on the other side of the panel, is economist, former finance minister, author of several best-selling books on finance and economics, author of um, tax reform in Slovakia. Uh, if, and of course, uh, we all know that tax reforms are among the most, uh, sub, uh, most important, most difficult and sensitive reforms to be undertaken by a country. And uh, Mr. Maurizio Pozo, former finance minister of Ecuador, also uh, chief executive officer of several companies, uh, professor of economics, and a person with business experience. Uh, so we'll hear from the panelists uh, about the subject of our panel. But I would like, by way of introduction, to only make a few points to start our discussion. I'm probably the only, not probably, I'm certainly the only non-economist on this panel, so I have the freedom, I guess, to say things which may not necessarily be uh, defensible in terms of economic theory or economic knowledge. Uh, but I would like to emphasize the importance of the political aspect of economic policies and about, more generally, the need for a rethinking of democratic capitalism at this stage. We are in a period of transition globally, and we must have a good understanding of the transitions which have happened in various parts of the world in the past couple of decades, and our panel is uniquely qualified to discuss them. Uh, there was a discussion, there has been a discussion, which is to some extent still relevant, about shock therapies and gradualism, which has characterized much of the 1990s in Central and Eastern Europe. And of course, that discussion may be over, but the, the repercussions of the policies uh, which were conducted in that period of time remain. Today, the democracies face a new set of challenges, not only those resulting from transitions themselves, but also from the new situation characterized by competition between democratic systems, which still are the dominant systems of governance in the world, and autocratic systems, which have emerged and become, became stronger in the past period. The questions, of course, uh, exist within democratic countries, and they have uh, created a certain degree of concern. I would like to quote uh, an author who I think is a very sensitive uh, commentator of democracy in the world, Michael Ignatieff from Harvard University, <clears throat> who wrote in a, in a recent essay in the New York Review of Books the following, and I would like the panelists to think about this sentence, uh, and I quote, the liberal state today is in crisis basically because its regulatory, legal, and political institutions have either been captured or have been laid siege to by the economic interests they were created to control. 
Now that's a thought of somebody who has been thinking about uh, democracy for a long time in a very serious way. And I believe that the question whether this is a correct di diagnosis is an important one. If not, why not? If yes, what are the consequences? And how should those who care for democracy look at the economic dilemmas today and what the solutions might be? One of the questions that has to be looked at is certainly the question of what should democracy deliver in terms of economic effect? Now, obviously, democracy is here to strengthen individual liberty. It is here to strengthen the political stability and create conditions for economic development. But does it also have to deliver a higher level of social justice? This is a question which has been discussed in different panels here, but I think it has to do something also with the question of systemic change, economic reforms, and democracy. Now, these are some of the questions that might be raised and could be discussed, but it is really for the panelists to tell us more. I would suggest that we have a first round of statements from the panel, that we uh, ask the panelists to give, them, give us their own basic thinking and I would like to start with Professor Schweiner first. Okay. Uh, and seven to well, ten minutes is the maximum, but I, I think that in around seven minutes one can explain I'll go, things. I'll go shorter. I think it's good to keep it uh, brief yeah. so we can go several times. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, the organizers, for uh, organizing yet another forum. And uh, speaking of sustainable development, which we talked about, uh, have talked about all day, it's nice that the forum is sustainable that it keeps, uh, keeps going. So uh, uh, my few in, uh, sort of remarks at the beginning that I thought would be important are that our experience over the last 25 years in the transition economies, those that were centrally planned, communist, and uh, have decided to change the system, that one can change the system, that really systemic change is possible, so that leaving the former system can be done. It's much more difficult to arrive into a system, new system, that everybody likes or that is performing well, be it economically, be it politically. Okay? And there were different paths that people have taken. Daniel Turk has mentioned there was the rapid Big Bang, there were the slower ones, and uh, in the end, in terms of science, data type analysis, it's very difficult to say that one set of countries, those that for instance adopted the rapid approach and used uh, mass privatization for instance versus those that went slower and didn't uh, do that kind of privatization, that one of them does better than the other. It's very difficult with the existing data to, to say. I think what is safe to say is that there is a variety of outcomes. Uh, many of them are imperfect in terms of what people would really like to have, a very well-functioning competitive market system with a functioning democracy and rapidly increasing living standards. What we have instead is a wide variety of outcomes where uh, if we take the region here, Slovakia, and Ivan Miklos was part of the architects of what happened there. Poland have been countries that have grown quite fast. Uh, others, Czech Republic, where we're here, actually has done surprisingly not as well as was expected at the beginning economically. Okay? The other thing is that uh, Pari Passo, together with that, we've observed that uh, uh, democracy has a very important uh, impact once you introduce it. So, for instance, the first round of reformers uh, in all the economic reformers in many of these countries were voted out of office at the beginning of the 1990s, early on, because uh, suddenly unemployment appeared and so on and so forth, a lot, a lot of these uh, negative phenomena, and uh, people were naturally unhappy about these outcomes. They didn't expect that there would be high-level unemployment, and so they voted the pro-reform people out of the office, out of office. So that's also important. The democracy immediately started to have its feeling and impact. And the other thing that's interesting is many expected that uh, if you go from the initial round of reformers to the more left-of-center parties, that reforms would stop. And again, the finding was that actually in most countries in the 1990s, in the first phase, reforms continued. 
They were different under the left of center from right of center governments, but in most countries they continued. Okay, so the question was then in the more mature phase, what were the countries that really managed to do the second round of reforms, building the institutions that were needed and continuing the uh, reforms so that a fully functioning market system with competitive features would emerge together with strong institutions, legal and otherwise, that would accompany it. And there we have a whole range of outcomes. Okay, from uh, countries that have succeeded relatively well in Central uh, Europe, broadly speaking, uh, to countries in the region that uh, slid back, as we see in Hungary now, in terms of the political but even economic uh, performance and mm -hmm. approach to things. Two, going further east, uh, Russia being a good example where uh, initial reforms, initial highly positive expectations were actually uh, later followed, but much more of a slide towards autocratic type uh, political system and limited uh, economic type reforms. And then we have countries best exemplified by China, where you actually observe very significant economic reforms Many people would say that the economy is now significantly run as a market-type economy, together with very limited political reforms, and therefore yet another indication that you can have a development of an economic market system with a rapid improvement of living standards uh, for many people in the society, and yet not to have political liberalization or introduction of Western-style democracy. So just as we saw in Pinochet, Chile, that you could have economic performance and market system together with a non-democratic regime on the right, we have yet other examples here where you can have it from the left. So you can have a systemic change in the sense that you introduce uh, uh, a new market-oriented type economic system. You may have partial reforms and not complete reforms, as well as example of more or less complete reforms and you can have democracy or lack thereof. Right? So that's a quick characterization of sort of what happened from an economic and political standpoint. And now just very briefly going forward, I think the challenge is really for many of these countries how to bring about further increase in living standards, which is what the population is expecting because expectations are relatively high. It's been 25 years and many people thought that they would be now in Europe at the level of Western Europe. Uh, similarly within Asia further than where they are, and how to, at the same time, really introduce or maintain uh, democracy and a system that really would have the liberal aspect of democracy that one associates normally with well-functioned democratic systems. And I think here we see that it's actually not so trivial. I would again bring the example of Hungary where I think uh, 15 years ago if we looked at it we would say look that's an example of a country that really has managed to introduce economic reforms in a situation where they had very difficult starting condition highly indebted as opposed to, let's say, Czech or Slovak republics, uh, managed to um, carry out reforms in a particular way, but a successful way, managed to introduce a parliamentary democracy, and yet there is a significant step back in the last several years compared to other countries, uh, Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, where democracy is functioning, and Slovenia being a very good example too, democracy is functioning at least in terms of the uh, uh, rules, regulations, etc. But there is significant level of frustration at different points in time with a particular manifestation of how the system works and to what extent the economic reforms can really bring about the advancement of living standards that everybody has expected. So let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, overview and uh, comments. I'd like that now to ask uh, Minister Ivan Miklos, uh, how, how do you see these transitions? Do you have a similar analysis of the transitions that have happened in our part of the world? Their messages towards the rest of the world, if I may put it so ambitiously. And how do you see the future? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and for thank you for, uh, to organizers for organizing this very nice conference. Uh, firstly, I have to say that because also the title of all this conference is Democracy and its Discontents, 
Firstly, I have to say that I feel sometimes that there is too high pessimism and discontent regarding the valuation of the last uh, 25 years, last quarter of the century. At least if you are speaking about Central European region, at least if I'm speaking about my country, it is historically the most successful period. And I'm not speaking only about economic development, I'm not speaking about quality of life. We can speak about uh, life expectancy, we can speak about health conditions, we can speak about environment, we can speak about safety, about, about uh, the, the independency. In, in all these regards, of course, it is very, very positive development. Despite of this, this kind of general discontent uh, among, among people, among citizens, we can also uh, touch this point. Why? Why this general pessimism and discontent? Firstly, I think the uh, first reason is that it was the expectations were too high. Maybe people expect even, even bigger progress, but then we can say that it was unrealistic or uh, more or less unrealistic. Second reason is that people are naturally tired from these kind of changes because during 25 years it, it was unprecedentedly big volume of systemic changes. And people don't like changes. This is well known from psychology that this kind of aversion to, to, to risk, aversion to change, which means this is normal and natural that in any country people don't like uh, change. People are afraid from, from, the, from the changes. But then, very important is to, to do some comparison which countries and why these countries have been more successful and which countries have been less successful in this systemic change. Because I'm very glad that in the title of this panel is uh, economic reforms defined as systemic change, because it was really systemic change. And let me to do two comparisons for illustrating the different results and different approaches also. And also different relations to the democracy, economic reforms and democracy. First comparison is uh, among three countries, Poland, Ukraine and Belarus. These three countries 25 years ago had approximately the same GDP per capita in purchase parity power. In case of Ukraine and Poland, it was almost the same. Really very, very close uh, change, uh, difference. Today, Poland has three times higher GDP per capita as Ukraine. And what is maybe surprise, more surprising, the Belarus has two times higher GDP per capita as Ukraine. Okay, we can, we can have doubts regarding Belarus figures because it could be not maybe, maybe correct, but still, it is, it is higher, much, much higher level. It seems to be that two main reasons are behind of this difference, especially between Poland and, and Ukraine, because at the beginning, 25 years ago, the outcome conditions have been the same. The same system was before, the same capacity or ability of the, of the people to, 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 to work, to, to invest, to, to do business. And these two main differences are integration and the reforms. On the other side, we, have to, we can say that yeah, but also in Ukraine they have democracy. But important is not only to have democracy as free election-based system, political system, but even more important is institutional framework. Because this is not only democracy, this is also rule of law, this is also independent media, this is also protection of uh, property, this is free and fair competition, this is functioning public administration, which is creating necessary infrastructure, I mean institutional infrastructure for attracting investment, for doing business, for, for to, to, to invest, for, for to be active. And in this regard, I think it is very important uh, that not only democracy, but effective institutional framework for, uh, for, for development, for, for working economy. And for countries like our countries in the Central Europe, it was very fortunate that it was a very strong anchor for doing these necessary institutional reforms and for doing these necessary institutional changes. And there was EU integration. 
In Slovakia, we are a good example of this because until 98, we were, we had very peculiar and strange regime. It was called by the, <laughs> Uh, by, by Pared Zakaria at the time, illiberal economy, and main representatives, main representatives of this illiberal democracy were Mečiar in Slovakia, Milošević in Yugoslavia at the time, and Lukashenko in, 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 in Belarus. And today, we have surprisingly maybe country in the Central Europe, which is Hungary, which uh, leader of this country openly declared his ambitious to build a liberal democracy in his, in his country. Which means not only democracy, but a liberal democracy, which means also protection of the, of the minority rights, which is also independent judges, independent media, independent and, uh, and so on, uh, is, 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 is uh, very, very important. If we speak about Ukraine and Belarus, it is interesting that if you have in Ukraine, there was more democracy than in, in Belarus, but because country was captured by oligarchs, it was huge corruption, it is no law enforcement, it is no institutional framework necessary for development, for attracting investors, for, for free and fair competition. Final result is even worse in Ukraine than in Belarus. And I'm speaking about Ukraine before war. I'm not speaking about consequences of the, uh, this year a war conflict with, with, uh, with Russia. I'm speaking even about economic situation before last, last year, before, before war. Another, uh, which means, what is necessary for the future? What, what, what is a lesson for the future for countries like, like Ukraine and uh, Western Balkan countries is that it is necessary to do economic reforms, but even more important, it is to create institutional framework based on the rule of law, private property protection, effective public administration, independent media, and everything this, which is necessary precondition for functioning market economy and, and democracy. And the best way how, to, how Europe can help them to do it is give them clear perspective, clear European perspective clear roadmap and to motivate them. For us, it was the most important. After 98, after Mechiar era, without this integration anchor, it could be very difficult to, uh, to, to hold this broad coalition government to, to do all necessary reforms. Because finally, what motivated us was catching up our neighbors, other Visegrad four countries in the entering European Union. And we knew the necessary precondition for this is to do all these necessary changes. And let me uh, mention also the second comparison, second example, and this comparison of the economic development uh, in Czech Republic and in Slovak Republic. You know that we had the same history for 70 years. You know that after division in 93, the economic level of Slovakia was much lower. It was less than two thirds of Czech development in GDP, GDP per capita. Today, just in this year, there are expectations that Slovakia reached the level of Czech Republic in GDP per capita in purchase parity power. The main reason, I think, of this is our reforms, is the fact that Slovakia did more deeper and more comprehensive structural reforms for speeding up economic development. And the main Evidence of this is that the biggest convergence jump was done between 2004 and 2008. In second Zurinda's government, we did a lot of structural reforms, package of deep and comprehensive reforms. And after almost all of these reforms have been started from January 1st, 2004. And we, if we compare convergence progress between 2004 and 2008, measuring by approaching the European Union average in GDP per capita, during these four years, convergence, convergence progress in Hungary was plus 1%, in Czech Republic plus 3%, in Poland plus 5%, and in Slovakia plus 16% in four years. Reason was not the European Union entering because we entered together, not the Eurozone, because we were not in the Eurozone at that time, between 2004-2008. But main reason, in my opinion, is 
are reforms and effect of the reforms for <coughs> for economic growth and for convergence as well. Which means, let me conclude, uh, what is the most important for countries like Ukraine, Moldova, Western Balkan, Balkan countries now is, in my opinion, to have clear uh, European perspective, to do their homework in uh, building instit necessary institutional framework and to providing uh, reforms, structural reforms for, for speeding up, for increasing uh, the, their, their uh, competitiveness. And last point, because today the reforms, maybe 25 years uh, ago, reforms were also a technical problem. It was not a practical experience how to do it. But now, 25 years after reforms, not only in our region, but also generally in Western Europe as well, reform are much more political problem. Political problem and lack of leadership is the biggest problem. Uh, shortage on the big, biggest, biggest problem, because technically it is well known what is functioning in, in which area, but the problem is that populism and short-termism is the biggest obstacle in democracy, in democratic conditions is the biggest obstacle for doing, doing necessary, necessary uh, reforms. Which means what is lacking uh, the most is, uh, is uh, political leadership to do necessary reform despite of political risk coming from this because naturally people don't like changes and people don't want uh, changes. But because global competition, changes and reforms are necessary everywhere. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this analysis which has uh, gone a step further and uh, has raised also one of the questions which I believe are of global relevance and that is how is it possible to separate democracy, liberal democracy and the rule of law? Are these two different projects? Are these projects so different that one can imagine on a larger scale, not on individual cases, but on a larger scale progression towards higher level of the rule of law and better institutional framework without democracy or without liberal democracy. Uh, this is something to be discussed further. But before that, I would like to hear other panelists. I would like to ask Minister Mauricio Pozo. We have heard about experiences in Central and Eastern Europe. It would be very interesting to hear how do these questions of reform look from Latin American perspective and Ecuador in particular, when Ecuador has gone through very important changes, not necessarily followed in Europe in all detail. So it would be interesting to hear from you about the Ecuadorian experience and also your view on these reform questions globally. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I think it's very important that we distinguish what is the starting point. Let me start from the, with an example. It's not the same. You, you have, for example, uh, economic growth rate of per four percent for Germany, then you have the same percentage for Ecuador, because the starting point is completely different. In the one side, you have on the one side you have uh, a level of poverty that is much lower than the other country, and therefore the effort that you have to make is completely different. Uh, the second point is what has happened in Latin America and especially in Ecuador in the last, I would say, maybe 30 years. Um, the common denominator, I would say, that has happened in Ecuador is was a, a non-stable a, a non uh, political system. I remember from the 2000 up to 2007, we had three different governments the actual one is almost eight years in the power, but in the seven years before, we had seven different governments, and therefore it's very uh, difficult to apply, for example, a very uh, organized economic policy. You, you don't have perseverance if you have continuity, uh, you don't have the, the political support to apply some macroeconomic policies. But taking away this problem that is maybe a problem, a particular problem, I think that if we want to, add, to answer the question what lessons 
we have for the future or what have we learned about the past, I think that uh, are very important, uh, I would say, key variables or key issues that uh, has to have to be taken into account. For example, you need to have a sustainable management of the public policies because if you do not take care about this variable, you are going to have other problems related to, for example, unstable macroeconomic indicators in terms of inflation, in terms of non-sustainable economic growth. You maybe provoke external shocks or maybe unbalances in the current account or maybe in the trade deficit account or things like that. And therefore, it is very important to learn that you need to manage in a, a good way the public finances in any economy. It doesn't matter if it's in the third world or maybe in the first world. The second is that you need institutionality. If you don't have uh, strong institutions, it's very difficult to apply a real democracy. The democracy is based on principles, principles of freedom, principles of equal opportunity to participate, uh, principles of a free press, principles that are based on the respect on other different opinions or different points of view in ideological terms and some others. Therefore, uh, it's very difficult to uh, preserve these principles if you don't have a very strong institutional environment in a country. That thing, I think that that point is very important. The other, um, the other lesson that I would add is that the quality of the fiscal expenditure uh, has to be directed to protect what is the, ro the real role of the state. What is, on my point of view, those goals? It is related to health, it is related to security, defense, and education. At least in my country, we don't have a, a I would say, a real difference between what is the role of the state and what is the role of the private sector. The state in my country, at least in this government, is present almost in all activities. The weight of the public expenditures in terms of the GDP has passed from 21% in 2006 up to 44% in the last year. It means that 44% of the total GDP is directed to cover the public expenditure. And in terms of the financial, uh, or the public finances, it means that it's not sustainable in the medium term. Therefore, if you have a better quality in terms of the fiscal expenditure, you can, you can spend in the things that are important as the examples that I have mentioned. The other point that I think is important here is that um, you need to introduce the enough incentives to generate an economic growth that can be sustainable in the medium term. In a country that is small in, in terms of total Latin America, but very open, what is the case of Ecuador, you need to attract FDI, foreign direct investment, to promote a sustainable economic growth. Why? Because according to the last eight years, the growth of Ecuador has been based on just the public expenditure. And doesn't mean, therefore, that it can be the same amount or the same behavior in the future. Um, the international relations for an economy that is uh, small and, very, and with a higher degree of openness, it's very important. Uh, according to the actual government, we are closer to some uh, countries 
that are not our main uh, traders, our main, I would say, uh, hold, stockholders in terms of the relations, and therefore we need to open this environment to other countries that are, at least for us, more important in terms of the of the economic um, economic growth. Um, in addition, I don't know if the, you know, but Ecuador is dollarized. Therefore, uh, we don't have monetary policy, which means that if something happens in the future, for example, a big declining in the oil price because we export oil or maybe a earthquake or something, we don't have stabilization funds to defend the economy against those factors. We need to recover the principles to have uh, funds, to have savings, uh, to recover the international credit lines, because we are depending just on resources coming from China, that are very expensive for us. We need to diversify the lines of credit for Ecuador, which I think it's important for any country in the world, and therefore to preserve the, the stability that we have uh, reached in the last years. Finally, um, I think it's very important for us and for everybody, I think, to take into account that uh, the systemic change is, is possible, is feasible. The economic reforms and the democracy are key issue, key issues for economic development and progress. But it doesn't mean that there is a guarantee to avoid poverty or, or inequality. We need to introduce other reforms that are starting from uh, a, uni a unique um, position of the country. We don't need a divided nation in terms of objectives in order to have common goals to reach the, the different uh, goals again uh, for Ecuador. It is finally very important to transmit messages for the society in order to explain the development of social indicators. Some governments, for example, Venezuela and also Ecuador, they use the frequent information to talk about the social results with different goals. But what I'm talking about is that the communication, the, the, the closer you are that you are from the government to the people, it's very important in, or, in, important in order to transmit the results and the advances of any uh, management of the public finances in general. Thank you. Thank you for, for your analysis and for the concluding remarks and also for the uh, emphasis on the fact that in Ecuador the large part of growth was due to uh, wise public spending, which, which I think is an interesting point in the context of reforms. Uh, maybe in the continuation of our discussion you could tell us a little more about the regional aspects because in your region, there were quite a few success stories in the past years uh, in uh, Colombia, Peru, even Bolivia, as we saw from yesterday's elections, uh, presidential elections in Bolivia. Of course, each of these countries had a different set of problems to deal with, uh, has different policies, but there has been a degree of success, something that we in Europe should uh, follow more closely to understand the re challenges of reform better. But that, of course, is for subsequent discussion. Now, I would like now to turn to Grigory Avlinsky, professor and political leader from Russia. We have to come back to, to Europe and Russia and to learn how do the questions of reforms in Russia look today. 
I mean, there was a period in the 90s when this whole situation was the biggest drama on earth, I think, with uh, shock therapy, with uh, critical and very quick, profound changes, and then subsequent development, which was of a mixed nature. But where are we now? What is likely to happen in the near future? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. It's uh, really my pleasure to be with you and to speak about serious issues of economic developments and economic reforms. But to make long story short, I would say when you mentioned uh, shock therapy, I would say in Russian case it was a shock without therapy. It was simply a terrible shock, that's it. Now we have uh, consequences of that shock. Because I, uh, I want to intrigue you a little bit and say that the main cause of the uh, events which you can observe in Russia now, first of all, the war with Ukraine, have its roots in the reforms, how they were realized in the 90s, exactly what you mentioned. Uh, let's, uh, a small observation about democracy from the point of view of economy. I'm going to speak from the practical side of this issue. For to have, it's, it's, of course it's not enough what I'm going to say, but this is the preconditions without which the even discussions and talks about democracy have no substance. First of all, democracy in the modern world is possible only if you have a private property in the country. This is the point number one. Secondly, to have the precondition for democracy, you must have competition between the different groups and private property entities. Thirdly, and this is extremely important, to have independent flows of financial resources. Without these three preconditions, democracy in the modern world, in European country, or even, I think, in the whatever country, simply is not possible. Now, in Russia, we had uh, systemic changes. But the outcome of the systemic changes is that these systemic changes didn't brought to Russia middle class. There is no real, real middle class in the country. Secondly, we have no independent media. Thirdly, we have no independent justice. We have no independent civil society groups and civil society as it must be. We have no independent uh, trade unions. And certainly we have a very weak political parties because there is no independent financing, there is no independent media and so on and so on, and there is no independent justice. In that environment you can't create anything like democracy. Now, what happens? Happens the replacement of the institutions of market economy by corruption and oligarchy. Corruption and oligarchy is also institution, but the, the institution of different nature. And this institution of different nature brought the country today, if you would ask me what, what is the system today we have in Russia, is a corporative state with the authoritarian political system. So this is no surprise that when the corporate says with the authoritarian political system have a substantial uh, financial flow from the uh, high prices on oil and other natural resources, you can have the situation like what we have at the moment with Ukraine in the country. So what are the lessons? There are serious lessons from that. The first lesson is that if you are making systemic changes, you must first of all think about creation of legitimate private property. This is not a case to make it fast or to make it by all means. 
We must create that kind of private property in the country, especially big private property, huge companies, which would create the confidence among the population that this is a really private owners. This is extremely, uh, I would say, extremely important thing. Secondly, very important during the systemic changes, the question not only what are you doing, but also how you are doing that. If you are implementing the uh, way of doing the reform, uh, so to say, that the goals justify the means, at the end of that story, you would have opposite result of what you want to establish. This is one of the most dangerous approaches when uh, realpolitik is a domination theory and you are making reforms as we did in the middle of 90s. Uh, goal is justifying the means. Thirdly, for the countries which have natural resources, on the first pl place for the reforms must be not the macroeconomic stabilization, privatization, and the things which are coming from Washington consensus. For the country with the natural resources, on the first place must be institutions. Institutions, number one, mean, meaning independent justice. This is the priority. Divisions of powers, confidence of the people. This is the key issue, and certainly private property rights. Certainly private property rights. The macroeconomic policy like privatization, liberalization, stabilization is also very important. But this is the second package. The first package is institutional changes. Now, uh, the natural developments without regulations always creates the oligarchy. Oligarchy is now kind of a disease all over the world, not only in Russia. But in Russia, for example, it has an extreme dimension. Simply, it's a completely coinciding property and the state power. They are all going together. In that, in that situation, you have no transparency and you have no independent financial resources in the country. Now, very important issue. In every country, especially in Russia, all systemic changes must be in the context of the history of this country. The, the fact that Russian reform reformers, so-called reformers, rejected the very important issue of rethinking the Russian history in the 20th century. First of all, Stalinism, terror of Stalinism, and Soviet period, now we are paying a very high price. Trying to put the all periods of history of the nation all together, creating the idea that they are not contradictive to each other is a wrong idea. And now we can see this. So the cultural context and historical context of reform in every country must be respected very highly. And of course, last but not least, uh, one of the most complicated uh, side of their systemic changes is to try to keep in the, in the highest priority of the systemic changes what happened to the human being in the country. What happened with the ordinary man from the street? What is the influence on him? And that means that you need not simply to uh, realize the reform like a military operation, you should have a dialogue with the society. And if the dialogue is long, it's not a problem. The problem is to make the reforms without dialogue. 
you would pay a very high price at the end if the society would not accept this reform and the developments would be very, very dangerous. So, as a conclusion, Russia had a very deep systemic economic changes, but the outcome of this is just opposite to the goal which was at the very beginning. And we must understand the lessons of that. And we should teach these lessons because sooner or later we have to start the reforms again. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, let me first ask the panelists if any of them wishes to uh, comment on any of the points made by the other panelists. Now, we have had what I would see as a remarkable level of agreement on certain points, like, for example, the, the importance of strong, credible institutions, rule of law, and the basic framework within which institutions work and within which they can produce the kind of reform effects that I expected. So that's a good beginning, a good basis for a further discussion. Now first, are any panelists interested in asking or commenting or anything that was said in the panel? If um, I may, one yes, small, Mr. Small, small comment what Grigory Jelinski said now about the relation between institutional changes and macroeconomic stabilization. The problem is that institutional change is, in principle, long-term change. Firstly, it is necessary to recognize the difference between formal institutions and informal institutions. The problem is that even formal institutions to change takes years. Informal institutions, it is even more complicated if they are changing by the exchange of generations. And then the problem is that you have not good option if communism is collapsing, as it was collapsed, without doing macroeconomic stabilization as soon as possible, you will have, of course, economic turmoil, high, high inflation and an unstable situation. And at the same time, you will have not the, the, the old system will be broken, because it was broken, and new system you will have. You will have. It is inevitable. Uh, I mean, so-called spontaneous privatization. You will have stealing of assets on the input of the output and so on and so on. And even it could be dangerous because what I have read about Bulgarian uh, transition, for instance, was that in this situation when this macroeconomic stabilization is not managed by the reformers, by the price liberalization as well as and others, other measures, Washington consensus, then you have even better conditions for those who were in power before, during communism, to take economic power. In, in Bulgaria, what I have, I have read and I have heard from, from Bulgarian uh, reformers, at that time, because this was not managed, I mean this macroeconomic stabilization as well, this was not, no shock therapy, so no therapy, it was spontaneous development, the main assets of the country have been gained by KGB, I mean Ukraine, in a Bulgarian KGB and mafia, and real mafia. Which means problem, the main problem of the, of the systemic change after collapse of communism is that you have to build, of course, these institutions, but it takes years. And it is, uh, what, what I am reacting on, on you, Grigory, is that there is no competition between to do what to do first. Of course, both is necessary to do as soon as possible. But without doing macroeconomic stabilization through price liberalization, foreign trade liberalization, uh, um, liberalization of the exchange rate, and a restrictive monetary and budgetary policy. Without doing this, which was done in Poland in 1990, in Czechoslovakia in 1991, you will have even worse situation. And of course, what was maybe also underestimate, but not such underestimate that it was, it was possible to do much better.
because institutional change is very long-term process mm -hmm. and even informal institutions are changing by exchange of generations. Good. Thank you. Any further comment? Yes, Mr. Schwener and then Mr. Olinsky. I'm, I'm, absolutely, I'm absolutely not surprised and I'm very thankful that you brought me back to that kind of discussion. But I want to say, if you're speaking on behalf of Bulgaria, yes, right? I understand it correctly. Slo Slovak Republic. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but he's talking about water, but Slovakia, whatever. Bulgaria. Listen, for you, for Slovakia or for Bulgaria, for Romania, the institutional reform became reality when you became a part of European Union. That's it. That's it. And then you, after that, you can just play with the games of macroeconomic stabilization, liberalization. You can do just inflation. We, for example, have experience, very, very clear experience, no population, no inflation, very easy, simply not to pay salaries, whatever. You can play this game. But first, your first step was absolutely right. You made institutional reform. You became a part of the European Union. That's it. For Russia, this is not possible. They took 15 years. We're speaking about 15 years. Yes. Uh, uh, Let's speak about, about one year or half yes, a year. Yes, it was not, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it was not the 15 years. It was absolutely clear what you were doing, preparing your country to be a member of the European Union. You started that immediately. Just immediately, every government in whatever European country, Eastern European country, started to be prepared. There was absolute consensus in Poland, in Slovakia, in Czechia, even if you have a changing the government and Not sometimes you have a strange government, I'm sorry, uh, government, a little bit, a little bit, uh, that as, as a being a citizen of the yes. most strange government among all the countries, I can just make that kind of remarks. But that means the institutional changes and all the other changes. Secondly, I want simply to say that the life is difficult, you know? Yes. That, that means that, it's, of course, you, you should do everything all together. You can't say, sit still saying, I don't care about stabilization, I don't care about inflation, I don't care about anything, I want independent justice, I'm not going to do anything. This is not possible. The question of priority and tactics and strategy of making reforms. That was what I was trying to explain. Only that. Yeah. And of course, you're right in the sense that the European perspective, which uh, the Central European countries enjoyed from early on, although they stayed, we, I mean, Slovenia, we also had the feeling of impatience because the process was very long. The whole acquis communautaire became a very arduous but uh, project, the but there was, there was progress towards that objective. It was clear that there is an end station there, of and course. we were working in the same direction. And that, I think that was an important factor that of stability. Was the so that's the institutional part. Now, you see, on the um, macroeconomic stability, for us in Slovenia, it was a very important priority from early on. And we have achieved that fairly soon. I was ambassador of Slovenia at the UN at the time, and I remember one of my early speeches was, hey, we have achieved macroeconomic stability, now we go further. And that was, of course, a very big thing in early 1990s. Now, 15, 20 more years later, we see a different problem, which has to do with reforms also, and that is excessive macroeconomic stability. A kind of a stagnation that we see. Yeah. Of course, the inflation remains low, but the question is whether that in itself is a good thing or whether we would need a small amount of change there in order to produce further reforms. But of course, that is something that will be discussed for a long time. Professor Schwener, you wanted to say yeah, something. So, so I would just add to it. I, I agree broadly with what has been said. I would say if in the 1990s the big challenges were at the macro level achieving stabilization and some countries did it faster and perhaps more successfully than others. At the micro level it was the establishment of a functioning legal institutional framework and that proved to be a big challenge. And I think now we are kind of in a second phase or later phase where I think uh, those issues are still you know, important, especially the functioning legal and institutional framework uh, can be improved considerably in some countries. Uh, but in addition to it come the issues of uh, sort of corruption, non-functionality that sure. was not necessarily expected you know, at the beginning. Yes. 
and uh, the possibility of illiberal democracy, bringing it to the democracy. That you know you can have the formal features of democracy and yet extreme swerving of uh, how the political system functions within a seemingly well-established framework. So I think those are really the big challenges here. Then I would say that there has been incredible diversity. These countries were quite similar at the beginning, coming from the same system. Now, if you look at uh, the various transition economies, the one thing that really strikes you is how diverse they are in terms of functioning, in terms of performance. And yet, on another side, is how much they can be affected by global macroeconomic features. You mentioned the lack of growth. Right, which is for many countries a big problem, some sure. countries less so. so. Again, Poland, Slovakia are doing better, for instance, than some other countries. But overall, how affected we are all by what's happening globally, and that even issues such as uh, lack of inflation or fear of deflation can set in in a variety of economic and political settings and is an overarching feature that, again, is common to many of these economies. Thank you. I think the panel has been sufficiently provocative up to now. I'm sure that there may be questions from among the audience, from people who are present. I would like to ask uh, each of the speakers to introduce himself or herself and tell uh, us what the question is or what the um, comment is. Uh, the young lady over there and then we'll go to the gentleman in the second row here. Uh, the microphone was closer to the other candidates, so that's why <laughs> the sequence was chosen that way. Please, Thank young lady. you. Uh, Katrina Matuchina, student of area studies, and my question is for Mr. Yavlinsky. And I would like you to uh, make a comment on your statement that we should think about cultural and historical contest uh, when we consider reforms. And how do you understand it in Russia, this historical contest? Because it was mentioned in previous discussions by Mr. Zubov that uh, there is no wish from people to decommunization. And do you think that Europe should consider this historical contest and how Europe should adjust its measures and advices to Russia according to this? It's, it's very difficult to, to, to listen to the question in this. Yeah. We uh, have a lot of echo, so... Yes, we uh, have such a strong echo that it's uh, very, uh, very difficult. And maybe you could just... Uh, the point so is, uh, what is this cultural and historical context that we should think about when we speak about Russia? Ah, okay. That's what I want to say, that uh, Russia suffered, thank you very much, uh, Russia suffered a very, uh, very uh, big tragedy in 20th century. In fact, in 1917, power in Russia was, uh, uh, as, a, as a result of the coup, was seized by the group of terrorists, if to speak in in general terms, modern general terms. Bolshevik party which came to power, which was uh, first uh, the head of this party was Lenin and then Stalin, this was simply a terrorist group which was suppressing the country for 70 years. Russians never elected this power, never, ever. In difference from Germany, for example, or Italy, or whoever else, with the totalitarian regimes. It simply was just grabbed and it was big pressure on the people, yes? So, uh, from my point of view, yes, and this period of time uh, created in Russia a very special way of um, ruling the country, very special way of the attitude to the bureaucracy, very special way of uh, the habits of the bureaucracy and the state system as a general. All these things must be rethinked. It was necessary to, at the beginning of the reform, to start the process of rethinking all this, opening the archives, saying the truth about all this period, giving the all analysis of what happens, because it was necessary to change the attitude of the people to all that kind of behavior of the state and behavior of the bureaucracy in the country. And it was not done, simply was not done. That's why uh, a substantial part of the society is still supporting such figures like Stalin in the country. 
That's why the events what going on just now in, U in Ukraine, in principle, possible, and so on and so far. So what I'm saying, I'm saying that economic reform can be successful only in a serious historical context and cultural context. It is not possible to make real systemic economic change which is separated from the soul of the country, from the soul of the people, from the uh, self-identification of the country, self-understanding, philosophical vision of its own country in the world. If you are giving wrong answers on that questions, you would never be successful in the economic systemic changes. That's, that's my message. This is a lesson from Russia. Thank you. Have a gentleman in the second row. So I'm Thomas Selich, I'm a local economist. Um, I have sort of very th three but very short questions. First of all, is there this amount of sort of self-flagellation going on in, in your countries as well when it comes to the crises? Uh, because I don't follow the media, but in the United States of America, it doesn't seem that the crisis did not bring the whole existence of the United States into question. It did so in Europe. Uh, second, my, and, and if so, why, why so? Second question is, you talked about reforms, and I absolutely agree. Let's take this debate to the extreme, and let's take a look on Japan, which, of course, very hardworking, very competitive, very efficient. All these reforms you talk about are on much higher level than they ever were here in 20 years ago or even till today. Yet, their 20 years is referred to as lost generation. And my third question is very similar to the previous two and also to the subscriptions that you have behind you, why I feel like I have let you down. Uh, I miss how loved I was 25 years ago, democracy, and I would maybe would also add maybe capitalism. Why is it that when countries have a clear goal, be it reforms or European Union or some sort of a goal like we had 20 years ago, there seems to be no depression. Once we sort of reach this goal, as we have here in Czech Republic, and also sort of connected with Japan. Once the goal is reached, there seems to be this feeling of like you have in a very long relationship. In the beginning, you're in love, and 20 years later, it's just, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, if, I wonder if you could comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I guess that these questions were referred to all panelists because, uh, and of course, I would like to uh, ask them to answer them according to their own choosing, not necessarily all three. But I will make my comments on all three questions later on. But before that, I'd like to give the floor to the next speaker from the floor. Could you introduce yourself, my sir? My name is Václav Zubransky. I have still a follow-up question to Mr. Yavlinsky regarding the issue that any transformation has to be consistent with the history of the, of the country. But I would really appreciate, could you give us a few examples what should have been done when you mentioned that transformation ignore the Stalinist history? You know, could you give us some example what changes should have been done which haven't been done to respect the Stalinist history? If I understood your, you know, example correctly. Uh, obviously, there was a really drastic change, drastic transition from one system to another and I don't follow, I don't quite understand, you know, what should have been done differently. That's my first question. And the second question, you also mentioned Russia failed to build the middle class. Could you explain in your opinion why is that even compared to the very successful uh, situation in China as far as building the middle class, which you still have uh, a central type of uh, political system, but open the economy, and why Russian fail, uh, the system failed to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to give an immediate response, or should we see if there are any further questions? Any further questions? There is. Okay, there is more. I, see. I don't see very well from here, because we have all these flashlights. If you, if you, if you hear well the questions. Can you repeat the yeah, them okay. for me before I, yeah, I will sure. start answering? Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, 
Well, first of all, uh, congratulations to all five of you because you have transformed your countries and continue to fight for your countries and have improved your countries. If Grisha, I call him Grisha instead of Mr. Yavlinsky because uh, he is uh, such a great figure in Russia that have, has always stood up for human rights, has always been a sensible voice, and if he had become president, of course, Russia today would be something else. Um, but you, my question is for Grisha, for Mr. Yavlinsky. Uh, when you mention that there has to be a constant dialogue uh, with the people when you do economic reforms, it brings a little bit to mind uh, what Henry Ford uh, said, that if he had listened to the consumer, he would have built a faster horse. So a lot of times when reformers find themselves as a prime minister in, I don't know, um, Bulgaria, uh, Filip Dimitrov, or in Slovakia right after Mechiar fell with Zurinda, Václav Havel here, um, they have to, and Mart Lahr in Estonia, who was extremely successful, they have to make a lot of tough decisions that if they ever consulted every step with the people that voted for them to change, you know, the country dramatically, they probably wouldn't get a lot done. So I'm wondering, uh, Grisha, what, uh, you know, if you have further thoughts on, if you were there in 1992, uh, uh, when Russia's economic reforms began, and you did have a role, but not the major role. If you were prime minister instead of Gaidar, what would you have done differently? Good question. Good. Any further questions? No, maybe we could now ask Professor Yavlinsky for the two questions. What would he do if he was in the position of Yegor Gaidar in the early 90s, how would your policies, your approach to reform be different from the one taken? This that was one question. And the earlier question was, is the cultural context and the experience really all that important? In other words, how does one combine the will of the political leaders who have to guide? Can one in a way, divorce that from the historic heritage and say, all right, we need something new. We need, that's how I understood the question. We need a big change. We need a departure from our historic uh, legacies. And uh, does that work? Could that work in, in a place like Russia? Now, I think that all transition countries had to go through this problem, but it was more difficult for some than for others because we had to open a new perspective, something dramatically different from our past, departure from history, divorce from history, divorce from our traditions. Now, of course, the level of drama was not the same in all countries, but there was a bit of that everywhere. And the question is, since Russia is the biggest drama in the whole transition world, how do you see that? And do you see a possibility for a really you know, a departure from the, from the traditions, the cultures, whatever is, you know, making the transition more difficult. Okay. So these are the two questions, and after that I would ask the panelists to, okay. to comment on the three questions uh, asked by the gentleman in the second row, uh, which really were very general and I think very interesting for all of us. First, Professor Yablinsky. Okay. First of all, I'm going to answer what I'm... This is a very, of course, it's a very... Uh, how to say it, actual question, what I'm going to do as a prime minister 20 years ago. It's very, very right time to speculate on that. But I would do this because it's really uh, just a question which always with me. Uh, what we have in 1992 in Russia, we had hyperinflation, 2,600% uh, hyperinflation the growth of prices, 2,600% a year. Second question, why that happens? It happens because liberalization of what I was saying was made in the country where there were no private property at all. It was only state monopolies. In one day, in the 2nd of January, 1992, the all state monopolies were liberalized from the point of view of prices. What can you expect from that? Only hyperinflation, the only thing. So what Gaidar did was wrong. Third point, 
That was in fact confiscation of the all uh, assets of the people. All. Because 2,600% hyperinflation in one year, that means that all your savings disappeared. Now, fourth point. But after that, it is necessary to realize, to, to implement privatization. But how can you make privatization after hyperinflation in the country when nobody has property? So the privatization happens, but it was 100% criminal privatization. It was shares for loans scheme. And the property went to the hands of a small group of privileged people. As we say, small group of narrow-minded people. Narrow group of narrow-minded people. That went to that kind of a people. Some of these people you know perfectly well. All the oligarchs, we are talking all the day long and see this is the people which get their property from that. Now, that means that you have not legitimate private property. Nobody believes in this private property. But that means that you can take this property back. Like in the case of Khodorkovsky, or today we have a case of Yevtushenko, all the same. But that means that you have no institutional relations of private property in the country. You have no independent money, you have no independent press, you have no independent, and so on, what I was telling to you. That was a wrong strategy of economic reform. That's what I was explaining. If I would be a prime minister, I would, be, I would take a different approach. I would say, we would start with privatization, let the people to buy the private property on the money which was in, in, in their savings. And step by step, I, was making, I would make a liberalization of prices during the year or a year and a half, 500 days, maybe somebody remembered. There will be different strategy, and we would have a middle class. We would have a middle class, we would have a, a property owners. That will be a different country. We have no middle class even now, which is separated from power. We have no. So this is a short program of the prime minister 20 years ago, which never happened. But now we have a result of that. That will be my different strategy if to compare it with the Mr. Gaidar. Now, thank you very much for that question. It's an interesting question. I was not prepared to answer the questions about 20 years ago. Now, another question about the people. Of course, Russia is a complicated case. But I'm very proud of Russian people. Because Russian people voluntarily and peacefully stopped the Soviet system and communist system. Nobody, no one have any idea that that can happen. And that happened under Gorbachev in five years. The country of 200 million people, 280 even million people at that time, voluntarily, without blood, peacefully, just divorced with the, with the communist system. And by the way, gave the possibility of the same type to all Eastern Europe. That was a really, really event which I think was the most uh, unexpected and the most uh, unbelievable in the 20th century. And that, that re happened in reality. That means what? That after that, it was a right momentum to start speaking with the people about one thing, that people is not a garbage, that people are important. What means Stalin system? Stalin system means goal is important, strong state, communism, or whatever. People are garbage. They are, they, we don't care about them. Some people would die, so what? Some people would kill, so what? It's not important at all. The goal is important. It was necessary to start rethinking all this, to show that openly, to explain that, and never happened. The war in the Caucasus would never happen after that. 
The war in Ukraine would never happen after that, and so on and so far. We didn't do this, and this is a very big failure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, I suggest... <clears throat> Thank you. I suggest that we come back to the three questions that were raised earlier. And of course, each of us has have certainly understood those questions differently. As I explained earlier on, I am not an economist. I'm a lawyer by training, and uh, I have worked in politics. So my response will be based mainly on politics and psychology rather than solid, mathematically defined economic knowledge or theory. And my answers are this, the question of self-flagellation, this is really something that is happening. I see this in our country as well. And of course, in each country, this has different um, modalities. It happens in a slightly different way. We in Slovenia, we often hear, in 1991, we believe that in 20 years, we will be the second Switzerland of Europe, <laughs> which is what we are not. <laughs> now, of course, we have a certain number of high mountains, and that brings us closer to Switzerland, but we don't have the GDP per capita at the Swiss level. And that creates a sense that we were not Success. achievers, that we did not achieve, that, that we are in a way somewhat deficient. And that creates then the psychological base for the self-regulation. Although, uh, never, nobody asked the question, well, but, but did we really want to be another Switzerland? We just want to be Slovenia, and we want to be as good as we can, and if we achieve something, we should be happy. Now, that kind of logic, which is close to me as an individual, does not work in politics. In politics, a kind of a pseudo-objective criteria prevail, and of course they are not without danger because they can produce psychological effect which is expressed in self-adulation. Second, the, how do we see the experience of Japan? That, that's really a very important question which is not dealt with in Europe sufficiently. And obviously there can be many answers, many explanations. My own thinking about this is the following. Many years ago, I was reading the book by John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, The Affluent Society. And what remain, remains in my mind is the idea that economies come to a point of saturation, that there will be a moment at which economies are saturated, where growth is not really likely to be seriously measurable, and there will be other effects, which I don't know what, 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 what the details were. But the idea of saturation is still with me as something that we have to think about. Uh, we have to think about what are the uh, relevant, realistic growth levels in, in West Europe, for example, what are the needed growth levels in transitional part of Europe, and we have heard from Minister Pozzo earlier on that, of course, high levels of growth in Andean region or in Ecuador are necessary because the starting point was lower. And we in Central Europe had also lower starting point than West Europe. So today, Slovenia is at the level of 2%, and we, are, we, we believe that that's pretty good in the comparisons of European Union, but it is not nearly enough given our level of development. So I think the question of when do economies reach the point of saturation, what does it actually mean, would have to be put much closer to the center now that we are discussing reforms and, and issues like this. And finally, the nature of disappointments today beyond this self-flagellation aspect. I would suggest that one of the big reasons everywhere that I see, especially in the European Union uh, area, is the concern about the future generations. We who, people of my age who have grown up children, we see the uncertainties. We see that we don't have very good answers for them. So, I mean, that creates concerns, that creates a certain new type of angst, as they say in German and fashionably repeat in the United States. Angst, because we are concerned about the future of younger generations. Now, this is my attempt. I'm sure that each of the panelists has his own view, a different understanding of your questions, and of course, different answers to the questions. Who would like to start? Should we start with you, Mr. Schweiner? Sure. Sure. So I, I'll start by um, going back to Grigori's remarks. I take his uh, emphasis on taking into account historical conditions as uh, 
saying more broadly that initial conditions matter, that countries may start from different points. And, you know, in the economic realm, it could be high unemployment, low unemployment. People have savings and can buy things in privatization or they don't have savings, right? So all that has to be taken into account. And it's important in determining how countries do afterwards, right? Um, what also helped the countries in Central Eastern Europe that were heading into the European Union is that they had not only the initial conditions, but they had the terminal conditions. They had something to look towards and to satisfy. Actually, you don't find examples like that. Latin America hasn't had it. They had the various initial conditions, but only Mexico had NAFTA as a terminal condition maybe, right? But even that was not the type of terminal condition like the European Union membership, right? Uh, that goes to Tomasz Sedlacek's point is, you know, what happens when you satisfy the terminal conditions, so to speak, right? And that's been the dilemma in Central Eastern Europe. That's been, in a way, the dilemma of the Japanese and Western Europeans. If we were here in the late 1980s or early 1990s, we'd be talking how Japan and Western Europe is going to overtake the United States, right? And it has not happened. It's just uh, at that stage where you have to sort of go ahead, innovate, be the first, and so on. That was much more difficult and has not happened. In Japan, it's been um, a long period of slow growth, stagnation. Uh, Western Europe has had it and may have it going forward. And, uh, and it's a big question. So what do you do when you're out there to do it on your own? Go further. Right. That's, that's, I think, is, is very important. Uh, and we don't have particularly good answers. We can see, you know, how the U.S. policy has differed from the European, for instance, in Japanese policies, and the U.S. is not particularly successful, but nevertheless, it's been now growing for uh, five years plus at a rate which is not very high, but nevertheless, it's growing. So, you know, there is a big difference in terms of the outcomes. I would still say one thing which brings me back again to Grigory's point. I uh, happen to have worked with a co-author of mine on uh, the role that billionaires, play in economic growth or concentration of wealth at the very top. And it turns out that when you do all the high-level empirical type investigation that we did using econometric tools and the best data available, we find that the effect of billionaires on growth is negative. But we go a step further and divide, and this is more arguably sort of challenging way, the billionaires into those that make the money on their own, like Bill Gates, and those like the cronies yeah, yeah. of Yeltsin or Suharto or others get it because of the crony capitalism political connections. Turns out that the negative effect is driven by the crony uh, billionaires and that the others have uh, virtually zero effect on economic growth. So I just thought I would share with you results of this research. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Miklos. Yeah, very briefly, I think uh, I agree with what you said that uh, regarding Japan, it is, it is easier to catching up somebody than passing him and to be leader and to sustain leader, which means it is easier. It was easier for Japan also to, to, to catching up. And it is maybe connected also with some uh, specific features of the Japanese, uh, I mean, economic system. Uh, not so high and, and free and fair competition, not so flexibility, for instance, in comparison with Korean, which is much more flexible, also on the, on the microeconomic, microeconomic level. Regarding uh, dissatisfaction of the people, I agree with President Turk that this is really also a psychological question, and it is maybe natural. I remember one, I remember one interesting story, but during that my former boss, Prime Minister, said to me that he discussed with Jean-Claude Juncker at the time Prime Minister for 15 years of the Luxembourg, the richest country in the Europe, which GDP per capita is 240 percent of the EU average, and he said to him during that said to him, "You have to be lucky, guy, to be Prime Minister of such a rich country." And he said, Jean Claude said, "Yeah, but the problem is that people don't know it." In the <laughs> which means this kind of natural dissatisfaction, especially with the achieving what we. We still need and want, want more, which is good on one side, but maybe some dangerous on the other side. And let me, uh, let me uh, say one short, short point regarding this um, hyperinflation in Russia and liberalization and uh, liberalization of prices and uh, lack of, of private property. Uh, in Czechoslovakia, it was price liberalization started in January 1st, 91. 
it was no private property at yeah. that time in Czechoslovakia, no private property. And it was no infl it was inflation, 60% during first three, four months, and then price growth was stabilized. Because, and this is important, private property is important from mid and long term perspective, but from preventing hyperinflation, the most important was together with price liberalization to provide restrictive monetary and budgetary policy and to uh, liberalize also foreign trade after liberalizing the currency exchange, which means I think that the most important reason of the hyperinflation in Russia after liberalizing prices was expansionary monetary. Gerashchenko, as I remember, was at, at, at the time was governor of the, of the National Bank of Russia, which means expansionary um, monetary and, and budgetary policy, which didn't create ceiling for growing of the, of the prices. Mm. Because in Czechoslovakia, as I said, 60% in the first three, four months, and then stabilizing of the Yes, inflation. because you have no, to that level, monopolized economy as we had. Mm -hmm. We had almost no, all the such, average, the not, average size of company here in Czechoslovakia was 3,000 people. It was only big state-owned companies. But you know, if you are liberalizing also foreign trade, and if you are not, 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 not giving more and more money, easy money to the economy, no, then you are creating ceilings for the hyperinflation. That's the first that's year Mr. Gaidar was the prime minister and Gerashenko was not a central banker. Was not. No, no, what, what, I'm, late, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to uh, uh, say that was Washington consensus was not only price liberalization. It was also these another three measures which I have mentioned. If they were done complexly, okay. all of them, then it was no hyperinflation. All right. It was also so, Poland case. All right. The remaining issues will be discussed bilaterally after the panel. Minister Pozo, what would you be your final remarks? Yeah, thanks. Um, let me add something. Um, the long term in Ecuador is one day because the expectations are very difficult to to create. One day the government shoots to the left and the next day to the right and therefore it's very difficult to to see what is really the north of the economy. Right now we have the, the benefit since we have high oil prices, we don't know what's going on tomorrow. My view is that the government has the economy just as a tool of economic objectives, but by itself, I think that he has no goals in economic terms. And therefore, everything that you can see is based on those objectives. He has gained the last seven elections. Uh, the, the, the people are supporting him, but we don't have independent justice, we don't have independent uh, public entities. Uh, he controls almost everything. And we talk that we are living in a democracy system. So I am not sure about that. Because the people are supporting by votes. Yeah. But the votes are not, uh, is not, all, is not only what means democracy, it means other yeah. things. So uh, what I'm talking, what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, it's a very vulnerable status. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, it's unpredictable, the action of the government. And if he talks with the entrepreneurs, he has one message. If he talks in, in, in the, with the people, the message is different. So in that kind of environment is very difficult to predict what's going to be the, the behavior in the future and what's going to be the future of Ecuador. Thank you. Now, we have come almost to the close, except if uh, Professor Blinsky has anything to add. He has been exhausted by questions and has given answers, so I guess there is no need to add anything. What I would like to say at the end is I would like to thank the panelists. I think they have shed light on the questions of reform from different angles. I think we are all richer in our understanding and wiser in our thought. Thank you very much also for your attention and I wish you a nice evening. Thank you.